Well, tonight, I'm going to share a message with you that uh, I guess it kind of goes with our series. I told you I was ra- we were wrapping up that series, and um, well, uh, okay, that series is over, even though this message sounds like it belongs in the series, I'm just saying. But anyway, or maybe, maybe I said the wrong thing when I wrapped it up. But anyway, the battle is won in prayer. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. But before we get to that... There was a man that hadn't heard well in a lot of years, and he went to his doctor, and his doctor uh, got him hearing aids, and they worked great, and uh, he returned for a checkup about a month later, and he, the doctor said, well, your family must be thrilled that you can hear so well now, and you can converse with them and everything, and he says, he says oh, I haven't told them, I just sit around listening to their conversations. He said, I've changed my will three times this month. <laughs> so, now, isn't it amazing that the Lord hears all of our conversations and yet he doesn't change his will <laughs> and cut us out? You know what I'm saying? But he's so gracious and kind even though he hears all of our conversations for good or bad. That's right. But here's something you need to know about his will for you. It is good, but it's not automatic. You see, that is a religious theology that's so prevalent in our day. And it is, well, I just, it's a doctrine of devils. I'm telling you, it is a doctrine to keep God's people from praying. Because we think, oh, well, God's going to do what he's going to do anyway, no matter what we do. And that is a lie that is nowhere in the Bible. All through the scripture, you see that it made a difference when people prayed. And Jesus said, ask and you will receive. We got to pray. We got to pray for the will of God. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. He said, to pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not as some kind of religious ritual where you just run through these words or say them so many times. It doesn't work like that. That's not what we're doing. It's not a game. It's not a ritual. But rather, Prayer and praying the will of God, asking for God's will to be done, as Jesus taught us to pray, that's how we bring the kingdom and God's will into this earth. Now, the good news about prayer is that if we pray in faith, God will hear us and God will answer. The bad news about prayer is that if we don't pray, God's not going to hear it. You know what I'm saying? We have to pray. He might hear us complain, he might hear us whine, but he won't hear our requests if we don't pray. Pray. Prayer is one of the great keys that virtually all of the blessings hinge on. We got to pray. We got to believe God for the promises of God. And we do that in prayer. The scripture says we have not because we asked not. We got to ask. Those promises are all received by faith. And faith, see if we have real faith, it's expressed in prayer. We pray. Jesus said, he says in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have faith in God. And then in verse 24, he says, Whatsoever, whatever things you ask for in prayer, you see, If you got faith in God, you're going to ask in prayer and believe you receive. You shall have them. I know there's some people that try to justify their lack of prayer by acting like the promises are just automatic. He's our provider. And he has promised to take care of our needs. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But Jesus also taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. You see, we're still supposed to ask. We're supposed to ask according to the word of God, but we're still supposed to ask. Prayer is so important, so vital to our Christian life and seeing God's will done in the earth. And in this great battle that we are in, listen, the battle is won in prayer. This is how we bring the kingdom. This is how we bring God's will into this world. It's how we receive forgiveness of our sins. 
Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. <laughs> it's how we carry our burdens to the Lord and turn them over to Him. We do that in prayer. It's how we seek to know Him more intimately. As the Apostle Paul said, I want to know Him. And you know what? If you want to know Him, you seek Him in prayer. It's how we ask for wisdom and guidance and direction in our life. You know, so often, if we just had the, the wisdom of God, if we just had the right direction and what we need to do in this situation, we could win. And you know how you get that? Well, James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given him. You see, we got to ask. It's not automatic. you got to ask God. But when we ask God, we get the wisdom that we need in order to overcome. Whatever you need, whatever you need, you ask in prayer. It's James 4, 2, by the way. You do not have because you do not ask. Now, in the very next verse, he says, you ask and you still don't have because you ask with the wrong motives. The scripture does not give us a promise that God's going to answer all of our prayers about our own worldly desires. I got one mm -hmm, and nothing else. He says, you have not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your lust. It's not just about our worldly desires, carnal desires, just selfish, you know, he says that you might consume it upon your lust. It's, it's the motive of the heart is wrong. And God's not going to answer that prayer when the motive of the heart is wrong. And the reason I'm saying that is because prayer is so powerful. We need to use prayer as it was intended to bring the kingdom, to bring God's will, to win this battle that we are in. There are souls at stake and the battle is won in prayer. So why do we spend, waste time asking for foolishness when there's such eternal things, things that matter in eternity that are at stake? It's powerful. You've got to use it wisely. It's powerful because it is the key to bring in the power of the Almighty into our world and our lives. And this great spiritual war that we are in is one in prayer. It is the key to winning our battles. Anybody got any battles? When Jesus was talking about building his church, listen to what he says in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Not even the gates of hell can stop it. He says he gives us the keys of the kingdom. That whatever we bind will be bound. Whatever we loose will be loosed in heaven. Now some people kind of get the wrong idea about this. And so I want to talk about this for just a moment. Listen, when he gives you the keys to the kingdom, that means that he's given you the authority that you need to tap into that power. That does not mean that you can do whatever you want. How many of you parents gave the keys to your kid and you said, hey, just go crazy, do whatever you want? No, we don't do that. Within the rules, that's what we say. And I want you to understand that we only have authority under God's authority. We don't have authority. We don't have no power on our own. Only under his authority and his power. You submit yourself to God, you resist the devil, and he flees from you we got to remember we're submitted to God. I'm just telling you this is how a lot of people get messed up. They get foolish and silly in their prayer, and they think it's all about them and what they want. I, want. I want you to understand that, yes, we have the power to bind and to loose according to the will of God. First John 5, 14 and 15, this is the confidence we have. And if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we've 
We have the petitions that we've asked of him. You see, when we're praying according to the will of God, when we're binding and loosing according to the will of God, then yes, whatever we bind will be bound. Whatever we loose will be loose. You say, well, if it's God's will, why did he just, there's that old religious spirit because we have to pray it in. We have to believe. We have the authority. You see, we're supposed to bind and we're supposed to loose. And there's a reason that he tells us that. About two cha- chapters later, he says basically the same thing. He says, Matthew 18, 18 and tw- through 20, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Real important verse here. Real important phrase. Again, I say to you. Again, I say to you. Now, he just, he said, whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. And now he says, Again, I say to you. In other words, he's going to say the same thing, just in a different way. This is a real common teaching method throughout the Scripture. You see this over and over in Proverbs, where it repeats something just in a different wording to help you really get it. And so Jesus says, again, I say to you. He just said, you bind and you can lose. And again, I say to you that if two of you agree on on earth concerning anything that they shall ask it will be done for them of my Father in heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name I am there in the midst of them. You see Jesus tells us that when two of us get together and we agree in prayer it's going to be done by our Father. How powerful is that? He's talking about binding and loosing and he says and again I say to you now here I want to say something about agreement in prayer number one if you're not in agreement with God it ain't going to work you can get however many people you want to agree with you and God's not going to move if he don't agree you know what I'm saying we got to get in agreement with God but when two of us two or three get together I'm telling you, he's there in our midst and whatever we ask our father if we're in agreement with him he's going to do it but when you get somebody to agree with you don't just get anybody you need somebody that believes And I don't mean just believe right this minute in the moment of some emotion. I'm talking about somebody that will not break the agreement. Because you and I both know that a lot of time we pray and we don't see anything change at first. That's the way battles are. That's the way standing in faith is. It doesn't take much faith to believe for 15 seconds. It takes some faith to believe for 15 years. I know nobody's up for that, right? But sometimes it happens. So... You get somebody to pray with you that won't break the agreement. It's like a spiritual contract. I'm going to stand with you if I agree with you. I'm going to agree with you no matter what it looks like, no matter what happens. I'm going to agree in Jesus' name that what we prayed about is done. Amen. you got to get somebody that really believes to agree with you. That's how the battle is won. I'm telling you, this battle is won by the mighty weapon of prayer. See, such tremendous authority we have to be able to come together with another believer and pray and see God move. Now, I keep talking about prayer being this mighty weapon and how the battle is won. And I know sometimes we see the battle turn when we praise the Lord. And, of course, we have a great scriptural example of that In King Jehoshaphat, when the Amalekites came against the Israelites and it looked like they would be destroyed, and he ended up sending the singers out front, out in front of the battle. And as they praised the Lord, God defeated their enemy. And yes, praise is a very powerful weapon in this battle. Make no mistake about that. But one thing you need to note is that before they sent the singers out, you know what they did first? Jehoshaphat called all the people together to pray. And you know where this great battle strategy of praise came? It came from prayer first. And I want to tell you, that's where all the great battle strategy comes from. You want to know how to win the battle? Pray, pray, and God will give you a word, or he'll send you an idea somehow. He'll show you what needs to be done, or he just answers that prayer and the battle's over, but... You pray. That's where the battle is won. 
2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. This is a spiritual war. It has to be fought by spiritual means. And the most spiritual thing that you can do is pray. Prayer is mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. It is the key to winning our battles. You know, in the book of Joshua, when Joshua and the children of Israel went in to possess the land, they defeated Jericho easily as they obeyed the Lord. But when they defeated Jericho... One man named Achan disobeyed the Lord and he kept some of the spoils, some of the riches of Jericho. And I know most of you know the story, but the next city they came to was a small city named Ai and they lost twice. You know what Joshua did? He went to his tent and he cried and he pouted and said, God, this isn't right. No, that's not what he did. But he did pray. And when he prayed, God showed him something was wrong. And I'm just telling you, you see, sometimes we're missing something and we don't even know what we're missing because we're not praying. But when, listen, when the battle was going the wrong way, he went to prayer and God showed him what was wrong. And when he fixed it, then they won the battle easily. I'm just telling you, it always comes back to prayer. So tonight, the bad news is, is that you're in a war and you have some battles that are coming your way. And I know that you can pretend that it's just fate. It's not really a battle. It just happened. You can pretend like it must be God's will for you. But I'm telling you tonight, there really are battles, spiritual battles. And the things that we see happen as a result of the things that are unseen. And so we got to fight this battle. If you think the adversary is going to leave you alone, you're mistaken. He didn't leave Jesus alone. He didn't leave Peter or Paul alone. And he's not going to leave you alone. Those battles, here's the good news. Those battles are won in prayer. So you need to know how to fight when you get in a battle. If you don't know anything else, remember this. The battle is not yours, but the Lord's. And he will fight for you. And this is how you get God to fight for you. You pray. <laughs> Battles are won in prayer. Now I'm going to read part of Ephesians chapter 6 again. I know y'all thought we were through with that. But I'm going to read part of it again just quickly tonight. I just want to, just to bring our focus back to that passage real quick. Quickly, beginning in verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual, wicked, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Y'all, y'all, do y'all realize that sometimes I get messed up reading the scripture because I, I want to I wanna flip back to King James anyway. I, that's my problem. But here's what I want to say about that. We need to learn that our real battle is a spiritual battle, and a spiritual battle has to be won in prayer. If we spent just a fraction of the time in prayer that we spend trying to deal with issues and struggles and battles in the flesh, we would win a lot more battles. Next, he tells us to get ready for the battle. Verse 13, he says, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. See, you got to get ready. you got to be ready. Don't be caught off guard. Don't be being a lukewarm, lazy Christian and a great battle comes. I mean, God is so gracious and so merciful, but I'm telling you, we need to be ready for the evil day. So we're ready to stand. He tells us how important the armor is. He says, and I'm not going to talk long about the armor tonight. If you missed that, listen to the message for last, from last week. But stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet 
with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And I want to tell you, all of the armor is important, but it's useless without prayer. You don't put the armor on to fight with your spouse or to fight with your kids or to fight with your neighbor or to even fight with some heathen. You don't put the armor on so you can go sit down and watch TV for the evening. What's the armor for? It's so that you can fight in prayer. When you understand each piece of that armor, it is all about you being ready to stand and fight in prayer. And that's why he says, without paragraph, without a period, even a comma, I mean, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. See, the armor is shiny. I mean, it, that's cool, talking about armor. But it's empty unless it's filled with spiritual strength from the Lord. And we need to know this. You see, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is where our spiritual strength comes from. It comes from Jesus. Apart from him, we don't have any spiritual strength. Our strength comes from Jesus. And we get that strength in our relationship with him. We get that strength through our prayer life. You know, in Ephesians chapter 3, the apostle Paul prays for the Ephesians that they would be strengthened in the inner man. How is that going to happen? Well, he was praying for them. And I'm just telling you, that's where our strength comes from. We pray for one another. We pray and that spiritual strength comes from the Lord. In Exodus chapter 17, Joshua and the Israelites are at war with Amalek. And Joshua is in the valley fighting the battle. He's down in the thick of the battle swinging his sword for all he's worth. Moses is up on the mountain. And Moses has his hands lifted interceding for the people. And when Moses' hands get tired, his arms get tired, and he starts to lower his arms, they start to lose the battle. When he raises his arms back, they start to win the battle again. Finally, Moses sits on a rock, and two men hold his arms up, and they win the battle. So, which is more important? I mean, you got to have the guy down in the valley, right, swinging the sword. But know this, human effort alone will never win our battles It takes God moving on our behalf. And that happens when we pray. When we stop praying, we stop winning. We can't even live a Christian life without prayer, much less stand against all the wiles of the devil. You know, Satan's, the wiles of the devil, Satan's favorite weapon is deception. And he is a master of deception. But most of the time, we don't fall for deception when we're walking and talking with the Lord. Why do we try to do things in our own strength? Prayer is how we get His strength. Why do we do the most important things last so often? Why is prayer a last resort? We'll try everything else in the arm of the flesh. We'll struggle and strain and do all that we know to do. And now it's come down to it. I guess we're going to have to pray. No, we should pray first, then work. Pray first, then serve. Pray first, then minister. Pray first, then make a decision. Pray first. Not only gives us the energy to fight, But it also is how we communicate with our commander-in-chief. You know, one of the keys to winning the battle 
is having communication with central command. You know, in a football game, the coach isn't in the game, but he's vital to it. I mean, if they had no coach whatsoever on the sideline, you might say, well, the coach wasn't there and somebody else filled in. That's not what I mean. If you don't have a coach, you don't have somebody that's on the sideline saying, this is what we're going to do. You just have chaos on the field. I heard Roger Staubach talk about this many, many, many years ago. You know, he liked to call audibles because he liked to be in charge. But he said that things were a lot better once he finally learned to trust Tom Landry. And you know what? There's a lot of us trying to call audibles all the time. We're just kind of winging it through life. And man, do we make a mess. But if we learn to trust the Lord and let him call the shots, how do you do that? Well, you got to stay in communication with him. you got to be in prayer. That's how we're going to win this battle. We ought to wake up every morning praying. Recognize the one who's given us another day. And we begin it with him. Not just rush past him into our day. We got so much we got to get done. Well, then we better take time to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. I'm telling you, the battle is one in prayer. So you just keep praying. Just keep praying. The battle of the ages was won in prayer. Jesus fought the battle of the ages in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was finished on the cross. But you need to understand that the real battle took place in Gethsemane. Last week I mentioned the sweat equity of prayer. Jesus put in the sweat equity of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane as he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. That's some praying. That's a real battle is when you sweat to the point that it's, as it were, great drops of blood. You talk about a battle. That's how you win the battle of the ages. You hear that these soldiers come to take him away and there's that betrayer Judas and Here's what we would have all done. We'd be like Peter. I got my sword. I'm ready to fight. Jesus was fighting in the garden, and he won that battle when he said, not my will, but your will be done. Anybody, anybody in here besides me ever have a problem with your will? Let me tell you how you win that battle. Prayer. And you'll see your battles that you face the things that you're dealing with. It's directly related many times to you winning that battle with your own will. Oh, man. I better move on because that one's going to be more than we can get into tonight. But you know, the Lord tells the disciples that prayer will prepare them for the battle that's just ahead. In Matthew 26, 41, he says, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He says, Watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. He's telling you, you guys got to get ready. There's a great battle coming, so this is what you need to do. You need to pray. It's prayer that prepares us for the battle. You see, prayer doesn't always change the circumstance. Do you understand? I mean, I think everybody knows this, that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He won the battle of the ages, but it didn't actually change the circumstance that he was facing. And it didn't change the disciples' circumstance that they prayed or slept. But you see, when we pray, what Jesus was telling them is that when we pray, it changes us. It prepares us for the battle. It may not make the battle go away, but it prepares us for the battle so that we can stand. So if you're struggling to choose to do right, you fight that battle in prayer. You can't do it on your own. But our battle in 
Prayer is certainly not just for ourselves. Prayer is how we see things change in our world. Prayer is how we change things in our workplace. Prayer is how we change things in our family. Prayer is even how we change things in the church. We just got to make prayer a part of our life that every day we are engaging in this warfare in prayer. Even when there's no problem going on in our life, in the mundane of day to day, there are always awesome opportunities for us to intercede and pray for others. Awesome opportunities for us to begin to pray for some lost person, for us to just believe God for revival in our nation. You say, oh, everything's good, I don't need to pray. Oh my goodness, look around you and you'll see a whole lot of reasons to pray. Reasons to get in the the battle and pray for others. Our life shouldn't be just about crisis, praying. We need to be prayed up and ready. I want to remind you, Jesus said this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. Well, the disciples prayed, but he was talking about being prayed up. Everybody, everybody needs prayer. Everybody needs somebody to fight for them sometime. Even those who serve in leadership. I want to close with Ephesians 6, 18 through 20 again. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change, that in in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We got to fight for one another. Always be praying and believing. Make a fresh start in your prayer life. Make up your mind. You're never going to miss an opportunity to pray and engage in the battle through prayer. The battle is won in prayer. Amen. Stand with me right now. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer.